this act had almost no enforcement provisions. It was a completely toothless piece of legislation. It was updated in 1988, um, and the enforcement provisions were much stronger then. So there is some thought that although the Fair Housing Act initially didn't have a whole lot of effect, it signaled that the federal government was going to start getting involved in housing discrimination. And it's possible that that loosened up the real death grip that whites had on the suburbs at that point. There was also major changes in U.S. immigration policy, particularly the, uh, McCarran, uh, the Hart-Seller Act in 1965, um, and the Immigration Reform and Control Act in 1986. And without going into all of the details, essentially these two acts um, provided for family reunification provisions as a major, um, a major uh, a criterion by which people could immigrate legally. And um, this had massive effects on, on the, the, the regions of origin of the foreign born in the US. Here's a graph showing the, um, the regions of origin of the foreign born. In 1900, about 86% of all foreign born in the US were from Europe. There was this other 12% from other, but most of those people were from Canada, and almost every Canadian immigrant was from, had been from Europe originally as well. So on the order of 95% of all foreign born, of the foreign born in the US at that time were from Europe. Um, pre hart seller we still have about 75% of the foreign born in 1960 coming from Europe. There are some small increases in the Latin American population. Um, past hart seller and IRCA, there's obviously this massive increase in uh, the foreign born population from Latin America and from Asia. So today, only about 15 or 16 percent of the foreign born are from Europe. So that's been a radical transformation in the, in the sort of ethnicity and racial character of immigrants. Third, we have, um, as I mentioned a minute ago, this uh, massive decentralization and deindustrialization of American manufacturing, particularly, but other kinds of sectors as well. So we have big rises in suburban shopping malls and outlet stores and manufacturing plants that all popped up in the suburbs. Um, I have one graph to show this. This is just a graph taken um, from six cities, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, New York, and Philadelphia. And it just is the sum of all of the job shifts that went on in um, the 1970s. So you can see that um, the central cities of those six metropolitan areas lost about 490,000 jobs overall and the suburbs gained almost two million jobs in this one decade. But that really conceals two different stories, two different patterns. Um, in the central cities, there was a big rise in high-skill jobs, like lawyers and insurance agents and college professors and things like that. The suburbs also grew in, in, the, sh in the number of those jobs. The real big change, though, was that almost all the low -skill growth in low-skill jobs took place in the suburbs, and there was this massive decline in low-skill jobs in central cities. So what this had the effect of doing, essentially, is providing a pull factor for people to move out of central cities and into suburbs. So we have um, increasing enforcement of fair housing laws. We have a much more diverse racial and ethnic population. And we have much more pull factors from the suburbs in terms of employment. Um, there were a lot of this continued growth in suburban housing supply. Interestingly, one of the real interesting details from this research is to show that a big chunk of where housing supply grew was in what we're calling non-places. So these are places like townships, which don't have an official municipal kind of structure. They're very loosely coupled with uh, county governments and things like that. And that's really been where a lot of the, uh, housing growth has been. I'll show you a graph about that in just a minute. So the confluence of all these factors, whereas in 1970, virtually all the minorities in the US in metropolitan areas were African American, um, and they virtually all lived in central cities. Between 1970 and 2000, there was this kind of moderate growth in suburbanization of the uh, minority population. So here's a graph showing this. Um, notice, interestingly, that in 1920, this is the share of the metropolitan area population that lives in the suburbs. So we're not talking about anybody who lives in rural areas at this point. But in 1920, African Americans were equally likely as whites to be in the suburbs, right? Um, if you just look at the post-war period, that first three decades that I was talking about, there's this real divergence of where people are living. Blacks became increasingly urbanized due to the migration from the rural south to the urban 
and Central City, non-South. And whites started moving into places like Levittown and moving out of Central Cities. When we look at the last three decades, and if you just think about suburbs, again, as kind of this overall group of places that are not Central Cities, there's been growth for all, all groups, blacks, whites, Asians, and Hispanics. So that's kind of the, the setup, because what we're really interested in is um, thinking about suburbs not simply as the places that aren't central cities, but also where those suburbs are located in relation to the central city. And so what we're gonna, what we end up doing, which I won't spend too much time detailing, at least the method, is estimating differences between whites, blacks, Asians, and Hispanics um, in what we're calling first ring gaps. These would be the average distance, sorry, the average um, difference between the percent, let's say, black that in central cities and the first ring of suburbs. So it's sort of the initial drop off that you get when you go from central cities to suburbs. And we would expect those to be negative. So central cities are still largely African American, suburbs still largely not. For whites, it would be the opposite would be true. You'd expect a smaller white population in central cities and then a big jump as you go into um, first, uh, first ring of suburbs. And then, you know, because you always have to coin a neologism when you do research, we're estimating what we're calling um, ecological distance gradients. This is a fancy term for a common sense idea, which is simply the extent to which suburbs get more or less white or black or Hispanic or whatever as you go further and further out, as you get further and further away from the central city. The reason we're using the term ecological distance is that we're not looking at the, the distance in miles. We're looking at the distance measured as number of suburban rings that you might go out further and further. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. The example that we use in the paper that comes out that, that produces this talk is if you were in the dead central city of Jacksonville, Florida, right in the geographic centroid of Jacksonville, and you traveled 15 miles in any direction, you would barely be in the first ring of suburbs. You would just make it to the edge of the central city. If you were in the geographic center of Boston, and you drove 15 miles in a direction, you'd be in the fourth ring of suburbs. And the argument that we're making here is, is that sociologically there's, some, there's a real difference between uh, a minority population that's been historically concentrated in the central city moving out successive rings of suburbs um, as opposed to simply moving in sort of a linear distance kind of a way. And so I'll, we'll talk more about that as we go. We're also going to, I won't do much with this in this talk, but we, we estimate effects of um, basically some characteristics of the population like their socioeconomic status and levels of education and English language facility. The argument being that in cities that have a much more highly educated minority population, uh, a minority population that speaks English really well um, and has some other characteristics like that, you might expect that they would translate those characteristics into further and further out residential locations. Another thing we look at is just the growth in suburban housing supply. It makes sense that in metropolitan areas that have lots of new housing being built, that sort of opens up the market for everybody. Maybe whites move a little bit further out, but then minorities fill in behind, and you'd expect to see some greater dispersal of, uh, dispersion of minority population in, in metropolitan areas like that. And then finally, what we're really looking at is both patterns in the year 2000, the most recent data that we have, and also how much things have changed over time. And so I'll be showing some different graphs that illustrate this. Okay, just to give you a sense of what ecological distance is, this is the familiar, should be a familiar site to most of you. Um, here's the central city of Cincinnati. This is Norwood and, and uh, what's, the, what's the one? Uh, uh, I was thinking St. Bernard is the one I'm thinking of. So it's a little, there's a few cities like this where you have these embedded suburbs. Um, but essentially what we've done is use geographic information systems techniques, my graduate student did this, to code whether or not a suburb touches the central city, is adjacent to, right, contiguous with, and then code out the next ring of suburbs. What are the suburbs that touch the first ring but not the central city? And what are the suburbs that touch the third ring but not the second and things like that? Cincinnati is a little bit of a weird city in part because um, Covington is this really bizarre shape. I don't know if you all know this. Covington has this very <laughs> long and narrow shape. So some of the coding is a little bit weird. Um, one thing you will notice is that there's all this empty space out here. And this is the non-place stuff that we're talking about. There's people live out here, right? It's just that there aren't 